you for giving again. If you have any questions on that, please don't hesitate to reach out and connect with me. Hey, this morning we're going to be um, continuing our series talking about uh, joy and the ultimate joy. And we've been diving through the book of Philippians. And uh, today will be the wrap-up of that book. Uh, We're in chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, if you want to turn with me to chapter 4, we've been encouraging you to bring your Bibles to church, encouraging you to bring uh, a device to take notes and to write and and, and to, um, uh, to be active and to put into practice what God is stirring in your heart. We talked about that last week. And so, um, this morning, I want to talk about the topic of joy stealers, okay? Things that steal our joy, things that rob our joy. How many of you uh, can relate with me? You feel like, man, one day you have this joy, and the next day you're like, there goes my joy, right? Something stole your joy. (laughs) And how cool would it be if we can figure out how we can prevent that from happening? And so this morning, I want to talk about joy stealers and... um, um, Maybe this morning, um, some of you ha- feel like your joy has been stolen uh, because of everything that has been happening in the last few days with uh, the opening ceremony of the Olympics and, and all of the, the posts that you've seen on social media and maybe some of the posts that you've made on social media and maybe some of the anger and some of the frustration and some of the, oh my gosh, I can't believe that this will be happening, right? And how many of you would be honestly t- on- be honest today and say, man, you know what, there are, there's been moments in the last two days that I feel like my joy has been stolen because of just the anger that has kind of stirred up in my heart. You can be honest, you're in church, God knows your heart, <laughs> right? Maybe it's only me, okay, so I'll change my message. Um, Shelby, you want to preach? Because I don't know where I'm going now, I lost the whole crowd. No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, I, I, and so I just, I just want to not ignore that. I just want to talk about that for a little bit because it's going to tie in with our message this morning. Um, But in John chapter 17 and verse 13, we've been talking about this as the anchor, uh, the source of our joy, the source of our joy, right? I'm coming to you now, says Jesus to the Father, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have a full measure of my joy within them. So what Jesus is saying is, hey, guess what? I'm going to tell my people what to do. I'm going to give them instructions. I'm going to give them my word. If they would follow my word, if they would walk and apply my word, then what he's saying is that they would have the joy that I have, the fullness of joy, The ultimate joy, the joy that cannot be stolen will be inside of them because they'll have me, and when they have me, they'll have joy, okay? So I I guess the question this morning is how uh, how do we look at culture? How do we look at what's happening around us? How do we look at, uh, and I'm sure all of us have our own understanding of what happened with the opening ceremony. I'm not going to unpack all of that, and all of us will land somewhere when it comes uh, to that, and and you you all know where you stand. But how do we tackle that? How do we handle that? How do we navigate culture? How do we navigate the uh, the currents of culture? Uh, What would Jesus do? Okay, Uh, we've been talking a lot about being with Jesus so that we can become like Jesus and then do what Jesus did, right? Would you agree? Does Jesus want us to do what he did? (laughs) Right. So if that's the case, I I just want to read this scripture, and this this is kind of not tying in with the message, but I thought this was kind of gives us some instructions on maybe how to navigate culture. How do we go about what should we post on social media? (laughs) What should we say? How should we tackle these things? Because this is not the first and the last time you're going to see this, especially going into the, the election year that we have. How do we tackle it? What, do, what, is our, what is our approach? What should our approach be on social media? <laughs> a, a very good platform, right? Here's what Jesus said in his word. He said, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. For us first, to be righteous people, to live a righteous life. Because through our righteousness in Christ, others are attracted. Okay? 
Blessed are the merciful, they will show mercy. Show mercy to others. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. How many of you go, man, I want that today? Huh? Blessed are those who are persecuted. Sorry, I missed that. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice, he says. <laughs> Have joy. Don't let it steal your joy, but rejoice and be glad. Because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We're not the first generation to be persecuted. Jesus himself was persecuted. Jesus was spat on. Jesus was insulted. Jesus was crucified to the cross. And so have been many. But there's a way that we approach that. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, do, verse 9. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessings because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. That is Jesus' words to us on how we should navigate culture, how we should walk, how we should present ourselves, how we should approach certain topics that become hot topics, and how we should live our lives. And so I hope that you take that to heart and you apply that to your life and you ask yourself the question, where do I stand when it comes to all of this? Where do I stand moving forward? How do I go about being like Jesus and becoming like Jesus and doing what Jesus has done or is asking us to do? And we'll touch on this as we continue uh, in this message today because it kind of ties into some of this through the message. If you turn with me to Philippians chapter 4, verse 1, and here is how Paul is kind of wrapping up this whole letter to the church in Philippi, and we've been unpacking his whole concept. He's been, Paul is in prison. He, he's writing to the church in Philippi. He's been so encouraging. He's been so building up. He's, he has been talking all about joy and the joy that comes uh, from doing the work of Christ as he sits in a prison cell, in a, in a dungeon. Philippians chapter 4, here's what he says in verse 1. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you who I love and long for, my joy and crown. <laughs> my joy and crown. What Paul is saying here is that, hey, guess what? You people in Philippi are my joy and my crown. The people that I've got to do life with, the people that I've got to invest in, the people that I've got to point to Jesus, the people that now follow Jesus because I was obedient to the word of God, I was uh, obedient to the calling of God in my life, and because of that, now we have a people that love Jesus, and because of that, I have joy. And you are my crown. The work that he was doing uh, to help the people to know Jesus, to point them to Jesus. So one of the things we'll be looking at today, and if you have notes, you're taking notes, you're on the app, we'll be talking about joy stealers, and we'll be talking about joy givers. Okay, Things that steal our joy and things that give us joy. A joy stealer here is being a person that is independent and inward focused in their lifestyle. So you're an independent or inward focused lifestyle person. All you focus is all your focus, focus is about yourself, individualism, about uh, how you feel, how your wants and desires are met, a, a selfish kind of lifestyle. Paul could have been only focused on himself and the fact that he was in prison and the fact that he didn't have to invest in this church. I mean, he had all these problems that he was struggling with, right? Like we do today. But what was Paul focused on? The people in Philippi. Paul was outward focused. 
He was not focused about his desires, his happiness, his well-being, his struggles. No, he was always focused about the community that God had called him to. He was focused about caring. He was focused about giving. He was focused about serving. He was focused about investing for the best interest of others to feel joy in their life because he knew if he could point them to Jesus that they would experience true, genuine joy. And so Paul was outward focused, not on himself. There's a passage in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 that says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and vermin do not destroy, for, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. What is it saying? Let's be others focused. What, is he, what does this passage talk about storing treasures in heaven? What it means is every person that you get to point to Jesus, they get the opportunity to know the hope of Jesus Christ. And if they receive Jesus Christ, guess what? You get a reward in heaven because you have helped a person get to heaven and you're storing treasures in heaven. Paul had a lot of treasure in heaven. Paul did not have a U-Haul here that he could haul when he passed away. But he had, man, he, the moment he passed away, God looked up at heaven and said, Thank you, Paul. Look at all the people that know me because of you. And he had joy. There's joy that comes when we are others focused. When there's joy that comes when we are not about ourselves and we're about others. The happiest people are the ones that are the most generous people. The happiest people are the most generous people, the people that want to uh, make other people happy, the people that want to make the life of others happier and comfortable. They're the ones that experience the most amount of joy. So what is our joy filler? Our joy filler is to be interdependent, to be in community, to be outward focused. And when we do that, in the midst of our chaos we experience joy. You should try it sometime and see what happens. When you're having a joyless day, why don't you start focusing on others and see what happens? When you start praying for your challenges, what would, if you would just stop for a moment and start praying for the people that you know in your life that need a, a touch of God, see what happens to your heart. See how your joy starts to shift and your joyless situation starts to be filled with joy because that is how God created us. He created us to be others focused. He created us to be conduits of His grace. And what I've shared in the past is when you're a conduit, things are always flowing through you. It's like this spring that is constantly moving, running water. I just got back from Colorado. Man, there's something about being in Colorado in the rivers versus being in Kansas in the lakes. I don't want to get into any of the lakes in Kansas. Uh, but you don't know what's underneath there. Uh, it's brown and nasty and dirty, right? But it's running water that looks so fresh and inviting. And our lives are the same way. When we allow God to flow through us, our lives look very refreshing and welcoming to everyone around us. But when we hold and hold on to everything that God gives us, it just becomes stagnant and stinky and nasty. And so outward focusness gives us joy. Then he goes on and he says, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Stand firm in what? Not in your things, but stand firm in the Lord. Joy stealer is misguided allegiance. Allegiance to the wrong things or the wrong people. Okay? Misguided allegiance, where our allegiance are in, in things that maybe are not of God. And if we were to backtrack to last week and go to chapter 3, verse 20. In chapter 3, verse 20, Paul refers to this. I touched on this last week. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we are eagerly awaiting a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus uh, Christ, who by the power that enabled him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. 
That was what uh, Philippians chapter 3 verse 20 uh, was referring to. And so here he, he uses the word citizenship uh, is in heaven. What does he mean by this? What was Paul trying to, uh, to get uh, here with the church in Philippi? Here's some context to help us understand this. Philippi, the people in Philippi, uh, the church in Philippi was a, 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 was a colony of, of the Roman Empire. And, and so they had the cultures and the lifestyle and the habits of the Roman Empire. And, the, and their, their allegiance was to uh, Caesar, the emperor of Rome. And so what happened is, let's say, uh, the, uh, Rome had all of these colonies established as they were gaining power. And so let's say someone decided to attack one of uh, the, the Roman colonies. Guess what would happen? Caesar would send his uh, armed forces to go in and, and to protect his colonies and, and take care of the people. And so Caesar was worshipped as savior and as lord in, in, the, in Rome and all of his colonies. And so what, what we see happening here is that Paul wanted to remind the church and the people in Philippi that their true allegiance should be to who? Jesus. Their true allegiance should be to the Savior who came to save them and not to Caesar. Now, Paul was not re saying you should not res respect Caesar because Caesar was appointed as ruler over the Roman Empire by the Lord of Lords. He still tells the people you should respect them, but the allegiance should be to Jesus Christ. And when he used the term citizen of heaven, it also, he was also saying it does not mean that we are waiting to go to heaven to be citizens of heaven. No. The moment you give your life to Jesus Christ, the moment you say, you know what, Jesus, I'm a sinful person. I, I, I accept your gift of grace. I accept your forgiveness that you have for me. We become citizens of the living God. We become citizens of heaven. And we start to live that citizenship here on earth, waiting for the kingdom to come. Paul was painting this picture how the church, us, the church, a body of believers, uh, are a colony of heaven, a colony of heaven here on earth to establish Jesus Christ's work here on earth, okay? And when we pray uh, the Lord's Prayer, your, will, uh, uh, your kingdom, let your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth, as it is in heaven, what it means is that Jesus has called us out of this world. He's establishing a colony, and we're in partnership with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God has a work that he wants to do here on this earth, and the way he does that is in partnership, and our culture, and our lifestyle, and the way that we live, the things that we believe, the things that we do, are things that happen in heaven. Because we're a colony of where? Heaven, living on earth. <laughs> We've been pulled out of this earthly kingdom and have been placed into a heavenly kingdom. And this is what Paul is talking to the church in Philippi and saying, hey, even though you're a Roman colony, your citizenship is in heaven. Okay? So live like that, not as if you belong to this Roman empire. It also means just like the, the, it also means just like Caesar would show up when a Roman colony was in problem. It also means that the King of Heaven is there to protect His people here on earth, that belong to His kingdom, and that we have hope, and we have joy, and we have this protection that comes when we belong to this kingdom that He's talking about. And even though we haven't seen the, the fullness of this kingdom, which we will see one day when, uh, when Jesus comes back for his bride, which is his church, it says we can still live in that, but one day we will be, uh, we will be transformed in our lowly bodies uh, so that there will be uh, like this glorious body. And yes, one day we have the hope of the full uh, fulfillment of the kingdom of heaven here on earth, but we still live today as citizens of heaven. 
And so what Paul is making here, a statement that Paul is making here to the people in Philippi is that we need to have our allegiance placed correctly. <laughs> allegiance placed on Jesus Christ and not on Caesar. So how does this apply to us today in the culture that we live in? Our allegiance doesn't need to be placed on the Republican Party or the Democratic Party or whatever party or whatever, whoever is running for president. Our allegiance should be in Jesus Christ. Our confidence needs to be in Jesus Christ. Our hope needs to be in Jesus Christ, not in any human elected official. And whoever is elected into that position, we respect because we believe that God's hand has been placed on them no matter what your opinion is, but our allegiance is to Jesus Christ Himself. The eternal hope, the King of Kings, and the reason it says the King of Kings, and we'll unpack this whole topic in the next month as we dive into uh, being faithful in a, in a culture that is corrupt, uh, our faithfulness is to the King of Kings because He is the King of all kings. He appointed every kingdom underneath, but He's the King of all kings, and our allegiance is to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And, and when our allegiance is in the wrong place, Paul says, stand firm in the Lord, because when our allegiance is in the wrong place, then we are stolen. Our joy is being stolen every day because humans disappoint us. Human powers disappoint us, but God never does. And so what Paul is saying is stand firm in the Lord. Uh, your joy filler is to realign our allegiance in Jesus Christ. Refocus our attention on Him. Turn to Him, and He will make your path straight, <laughs> Right? And then he goes on in verse 2 and 3. And I plead with you, Yodia, uh, don't, don't name your kids this, and plead with you, <laughs> Sintachi, wow, uh, <laughs> two ladies that were living in the, in the church world, I plead, he's pleading with them to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companions, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of the co-workers who, whose names are in the book of life. So what is happening here? We see that Paul has been doing work, the work of God with these ladies or with a group of people, especially these two ladies. But these two ladies have, for some reason, are now not seeing eye to eye. <laughs> They're having disagreements. Joy stealer. This unity, this unity that begins within the church also spreads uh, to our culture and our communities, okay? He's talking about the disunity that is starting to see happen within the church. In a Christian community where the whole ethos uh, ought to be of one mutual love, forgiveness, and support, what we need to see is that each person, what we, but we, what we see is that each person starts to accuse the other person of something that they did wrong or that they did, didn't line up with the way they saw, or that they broke uh, the code of conduct or whatever it is, and it, it starts to break down the whole system, and we, we walk away from healing and forgiveness and pointing fingers. And that is happening today in the church world. That is happening within these four walls sometimes where we maybe uh, have different opinions. But what, what, what is Paul saying here? I, I think it's important for us to understand. He said that uh, he's pleading with them to be of what? The same mind in the who? Lord. Uh, let me ask you this for a second. Can you be in the Lord and have different opinions? I mean, you're a human being. Yes, you can. But does being in the Lord, does, but would God tell one person, hey, you need to be, you, you need to be focused on this and, and, and have this, and then you should be focused on this, and then he creates disunity? If you worship the same God, there is unity, Right? But when we start worshiping things that are not of God, then we start to see disunity entering our communities and our culture. 
This is why Paul is saying we are a citizen of heaven because there's only one king. And when there's more than one king, what happens? There's disunity. (laughs) Because you have two bosses that are trying to tell you two different things. But when there's one king, then there's only one message, there's only one focus, there's only one purpose, there's only one plan. There is only one way, and that is the way to Jesus. And so then there forms this unity that we see happening. When we're in control, when we are the boss, when we become selfish, what we see happening is disunity. And disunity steals our joy. We see this in our homes. We see this in our marriages. If our home was about the Lord, there'll be unity. If our marriage was about the Lord, then there will be unity. If a husband and wife is praying to the same Lord, and husband, is, husband and wife are praying together to the same Lord, guess what's going to happen in that marriage? Unity. But when there's disunity, and you may be seated in here this morning, maybe you walked in with a disagreement, husband and wife, and you know that your joy has been stolen, right? <laughs> How many of you have been there? Is it just me or... Uh, some of you are uh, being honest, the rest of you are lying. Uh, but you know what I'm talking about, right? But when we're in the Lord, what happens? There's unity. It's with our kids. If we are focused on the Lord and the whole family is focused on the Lord, there's unity with our kids in our communities, in our churches, in our country. This unity steals our joy. But the people of God have the opportunity to display what unity looks like and what, how unity can be practiced and how unity can lead to joy again. So joy filler. Unity in the Lord. To be united in the Lord. To be with Jesus so that we can become like Jesus and do the things that Jesus is asking us to do, which leads to unity. And then he goes on to Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And many of you have heard this verse over and over again. Rejoice in the Lord always, and I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Man, this could be a whole passage that I could preach on, talking about anxiety, talking about worry, talking about being in Christ and how we find identity in Him. But a joy stealer here is a faulty heart posture. A faulty heart posture, where a heart posture is focused on anything other than Jesus Christ himself. Paul is challenging us to live an exuberant lifestyle. Uh, What does that mean? A a, a life that is excited, a life that is full of joy, a life that people look and are attracted to because of our energy and our excitement because we are in Christ and our lifestyle is always about hope and it's always about peace and it's always about rejoicing and it's always about outward focus and it's always about loving others, an exuberant lifestyle in all circumstances. Now, you may be like, that. how do you do that? Well, you can't do that in your own strength. You can only do that by being in Christ. And when we do that, that becomes contagious. Now, he's not calling you to be a fake optimist, but a Christ-centered optimist that comes from our faith and hope in Jesus Christ. Yes, we do have challenging times in our life. Yes, we go through hardships. Yes, we go through pain. And we have to be real. But then with Jesus... We find this joy, we find this peace that passes all understanding. And that is what Paul is referring to here. But he also goes on to say, live a life of gentleness. Gentleness. How many of us were gentle when we saw what happened with the opening ceremonies at the Olympics? How many of us were gentle, and by the way, I'm not pointing fingers here, I'm just sharing thoughts here. How many of us were gentle when uh, different leaders are giving their statements in regards to the elections? But that, that is what he's calling us to do. 
Because out of gentleness, we're able to then be the hands and feet of Jesus and point people back to the most important things. Gentleness that leads to joy for you and for others. Not stealing your joy, but leads to joy for you and others. Grace-filled, not abrasive. This is a hard posture. It's a hard posture. What did Jesus do when he encountered the prostitute? Was he gentle? What did Jesus do when he encountered the woman at the well who had multiple husbands and the religious leaders were about to kill her? Was he gentle? What did Jesus do while he was hanging on the cross and a thief next to him said, hey, will you remember me today when you are with your father? What did he do? Was he gentle? What did Jesus do with Peter after he, after he uh, uh, betrayed him three times? And he came back and he cooked him a meal at the, uh, and he, he reinstated him to do the work. Was he gentle? What did Jesus do with you? Just, just reflect on your life. How has he treated you? How has he embraced you? How has he received you back into the kingdom? Has there been gentleness? Jesus is about gentleness. Gently correcting, gently restoring, gently reinstating, gently giving us new identities, gently giving us hope and healing. How do we go about it? Gentleness. And then he goes on to say, live a life of prayer and thanksgiving. That leads to a life of peace and joy versus anxiety, worry, stress, encouraging a life of uh, exuberant that comes from a gentle and a prayer-filled life. As I was praying this week, uh, I had this phrase that popped in my head that uh, uh, pray first and post second. Pray first before you post. Because it's very hard to pray and then post something hateful towards a person. Keep in mind, as we go through this whole season that we're getting ready to navigate, that our, our battle is not against flesh or blood, but against a higher power. A battle that is raging in the unseen. It's not against man. The devil wants you to be hateful, lack of gentleness, so that you can hurt other humans. Created in the image of God, by the way. But Jesus wants you to be gentle, to pray in every situation. Because when we pray, we have the heart of God, our heart posture changes, and then we lack the, we, we don't experience the anxiety and the, and the stress that starts to stir up in our hearts and the, and the fear of the unknown and, and all of the things that start to kind of bubble up inside of us. God's peace is the opposite to human anxiety. And we receive that peace by being with the peace giver, by being near to the Lord, because the Lord is near is what the, what the passage says. So a joy filler is to receive the heart of Christ. To receive the heart of Christ. And lastly, and we'll wrap up with this, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, think of this, guys. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think of such things. And let me tell you right now, social media does not give you any of that. The news, Fox or ABC does not give you any of that. The world and everything that the world is offering does not give you any of that. But if you want to know what is true, what is noble, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, excellent and praiseworthy, go to the Word of God. God. That is where you find it. And when you focus on those things, be transformed by the what? Renewing of your 
mind because our minds have been polluted by poison given to us by our media that is lying to us and is causing us to be anxious, that is causing us to be angry, that is causing us to post in ways that are not God ordinary, that is causing us to walk in ways that are dishonoring to God. But what God is saying is, hey, if you focus on that, that is how you will act. If you put inside of what you put inside of you is what's going to come out. If you put inside lies, well, guess what? You're going to respond to lies. If you put in the truth and the word of God, you're going to respond with truth and love. Let's put in more of Jesus by being in his word and allow the love of Jesus to come outside of us and to walk the way Jesus walked when he was spat on, when he was beat up on, and when he was finally crucified on the cross. It was in humility that he defeated the devil. Joy stealer, a polluted mind, a polluted mind. Joy filler, a purified mind, a mind that is purified by the love of Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me this morning? Here's something I want to ask you to do this morning. I want you to release. I want you to release. Okay? So if you do something with me, if you take your hands right now, okay? And you say, I release. I release what I have. I release my control. I release the joy stealers that I, have, that I have got in my life, I release and I receive what you have, Jesus. To release and to receive. To release, to let go and to receive what he has. To release and receive the joy that he has. To release and receive the peace that he has. To release and receive the hope that he has. To release and receive the transformation of our minds so that we think differently, we see differently, and we act differently. To release the anger and the hatred and to receive love, peace, joy so that we see people made in the image of God, not as enemies that we can destroy. Because that is what God is calling the church to be. A countercultural church. Kingdom minded, citizens of heaven, a colony where we receive our hope from heaven, not from this earth. So I'm asking the worship team to lead us out. And even as we sing this song, let's prepare our hearts to release and receive. Lead us out, worship team.